All right, everyone. So this is the first official live podcast recording where members of the community have access to the uh, to the live recording to to us, you know, on the spot, uh, doing it and talking through it. So you know, members of the community can ask questions, chime in as we're talking, and we'll try to weave everything into the discussion, um, you know, wherever it sort of flows uh, naturally. So this week we're going to talk about a pretty big topic. Um, just broadly speaking, the first principles of hypertrophy training, um, which is obviously, you know, there are a lot of different component parts to what creates the outcome of hypertrophy and muscle growth. So, so just to contextualize when we're talking about muscle growth, um, you know, we have all these different kinds of things to consider like nutrition, you know, uh, sleep, what kind of split you're doing, X, things like exercise order, um, all the different programming variables and how they relate and how they may change from case to case. We're going to start pretty broad here and we're just going to try to focus on the sort of training only aspect, um, you know, and we'll kind of see where it goes in so far as like how far outward we go, um, because I could see it sort of expanding pretty quickly after, <laughs> after the initial layer of just like, you know, major first principles. Um, but we'll try to stay mostly training related. Uh, and if we veer off into the direction of like too far programming or too far nutrition, somehow I'm going to throw out the fishing line and I'm going to, and I'm going to reel us back or, I, or at least I'll attempt to. Okay. So I thought it would be helpful just to start Ethan with, um, the sort of analogy, uh, that you laid out for me just via text. I think that's actually a really, uh, cool way to sort of think about it. And I also think it would be helpful for people to kind of get a sense of like how you initially start to answer this kind of question or think about this kind of thing from a, a paradigm based perspective perspective. So rather than starting at, okay, what are the first principles? I'm, I'm interested in how you arrive at that, that place to begin with, because I think that kind of shows an interesting process that is not necessarily obvious when you just start talking about something, right? So we could just start talking about the X's and O's, but I actually would like you to sort of outline those, those, that analogy you gave me, and then maybe just how you sort of arrived um, at that point, maybe to, to begin with. Yeah, so here's where my head went when you initially mentioned this concept of like, what are, you know, first principles of hypertrophy. And, you know, as you know, I like to zoom super far out and then kind of come back, you know, more and more specific, as you mentioned. Yeah. And maybe just as a question for you, too, is like, what do you how would you define like a first principle for those for people who may not be familiar just with the term overall? Because. Hmm. Because I would define it if 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 you want to kind of bounce back and forth about this, I would define it as basically like it's it's kind of like it can be somewhat abstract, but to make it concrete, it's kind of like what is the sort of foundational uh, thing that can almost no longer be broken down further that then you extract all this other information from. So like a first principle of physics, for example, um, you know, is, is understanding like, uh, you know, Newton's three laws, for example, or, you know, all those are first principles of physics that sort of lay the foundation, the sort of building blocks for all the other things that we extrapolate about force. Um, so that's kind of just maybe a concrete example, but how did, how do you sort of think about it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in the same way, kind of like reverse order, it's like what you know much like you were saying in physics like we have laws you know these these things that you know are, are sort of you know immutable to to a degree and you know of course like when it comes to a, a newer science like the science you know of exercise that is made up of all these other sciences you know the physics and chemistry and biology um you know we really don't have um any like laws uh within a field like that but we do have some laws you know and some very very you know at least strong theories that live in these other fields so sometimes we have to go all the way back to those fields to sort of feel confident enough to say like okay this is something that we can you know this is a leg we can really stand on but at least here today i think we'll try to get down to like the least amount of concepts that basically like uh, almost like a tree branch out into, into everything else, you know, thereafter. So what are kind of like the unifying principles um, that we can then, you know, dissect uh, 
and uh, you know, sort of pull apart what you actually see in practice. And that I think is always like what learning is. And I think, you know, when you're studying other fields at the same time or kind of concepts that are, uh, you know, just slightly adjacent to exercise, you can start to see where all these things, you know, sort of mirror each other, uh, where, you know, nutritional principles mirror training principles, you know, where basic just stress physiology, you know, underlies all this. So I think when zooming out, you know, for a concept like this, we almost have to zoom out more broadly than just like this idea of, you know, hypertrophy. And oftentimes it does come down to just like a basic understanding of, you know, stress physiology and sort of like what, uh, you know, what begets adaptation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's yeah. kind of where I went with it was just like, all right, let me just like super quickly zoom out and then let me try to narrow my scope so we can actually like get something, you know, accomplished in these conversations. But sometimes the framing is just helpful. So, you know, at least once you start with a really wide lens and then you narrow it down and down, you're not going from like narrow to wide and back to narrow and kind of get lost. Like we can follow kind of this, like, you know, um, you know, contiguous path and like, we can have a direction that we're moving in. Yeah. So and just, just one thing to interject there, sorry. Um, is I, th I think a good example to draw from, from another field and a, and a point that's important to make about like why these first principles are so important is um Je so i was listening to jeff bezos like on a podcast um and i was also listening to other podcasts where people were talking about him and for those of you who don't know he's the founder ceo of amazon or was a ceo but uh it has now stepped into different roles there everyone probably knows who jeff bezos is right like super rich dude uh and he once said that the only laws that he abides by <laughs> someone asked him a question about amazon <laughs> You said the only laws I abide by are those of physics, which I think is kind of funny. But um, when you ask him like what a first principle of the company is, he'll say, well, our our top tier first principle is the idea of customer first, right? So, so the idea is essentially a first principles are these foundational concepts out of which you extract logic and thought processes and decision making processes so that so that each decision that you can make can ultimately be led back to this foundational thing because if you don't have that foundational thing then you're kind of just throwing darts at boards uh, and throwing shit at fans to see kind of like what sticks so just for important uh context but anyway um yeah i'm interested in that whole uh, analogy thing that you uh came up with here as well for a starting point yeah, that makes sense. What you said, it's like, in a way, it's kind of a bullshit meter, you know, maybe yeah. going to school and understanding, um, you know, if you go to school for exercise science, and you take a basic physiology course, you know, and later you're watching, you know, TikTok or whatever, like, you have some foundation to, you know, call bullshit if it doesn't follow those, those principles. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That. so you know, when you introduced this concept, you know, my mind kind of like, I almost picture like the, um, you know, kind of the universe laying out in front of me. And it's like, wow, there's a million <laughs> directions we can go here. So let's like, I don't know, it's like opening the cheesecake factory menu. And you're like, all right, we gotta, we gotta narrow some shit down. Right. Because <laughs> it's like, first you got to decide, like, do I want breakfast? Do I want dinner? Like, um, you know, are we going to go, are we just going to forget calories like all together and we're going to go in on this meal or mm -hmm. we still try to stay, you know, relatively healthy. And then every decision kind of narrows it down. And now we're like, you know, we're caught between, you know, a few different options, I think, which is like where we'll try to go today. Um, so for me, the first thought is like, okay, I know the direction that I think this group wants to go in, which is going to be you know, mostly related to like the practical application of like what we're going to do in the gym. But what is the reality of all the things that influence this, you know, adaptation of, you know, skeletal muscle hypertrophy? And, you know, is resistance training even necessary for that adaptation? Um, and it's not, you know, first of all, I think it's always important to contextualize that some of these things that we think as, um, you know, as, as necessary 
components or you know just natural assumptions that we we bake into things are really just like human constructs that have just become sort of like standard practice over time and it, it may indeed be the most practical way we have to achieve it but it's important to realize that it's still very much like a, a, a human and kind of a social construct you know that we've created so obviously people um and, and animals you know they hypertrophy without uh, the addition of resistance training, right? Like just going through, you know, just, just growing, uh, you know, from, you know, an infant to, uh, you know, a toddler to, you know, going through puberty, being a full blown adult, like we can see that hypertrophy happens, you know, without any, you know, uh, intentional outside influence. Um, there is the influence of just like being on planet earth and just dealing with gravity. And that is part of, you know, that's a large part of the resistance that we're dealing with and, you know, is a component of this like chemical signaling process that ultimately results in hypertrophy. Because we see if like, you know, whether it be like a, a rat study or, you know, a mouse study or like, um, you know, a human study where you take a limb, you know, and, and you, you put it in a cast and a person, you know, can't move it or they're on bed rest for a given period of time, like, or they go to to outer space, you know, that hypertrophy is going to drop off pretty quickly. And it's like, well, you know, why might that happen? It's just no longer necessary. You know, it's no longer like a key component uh, for the survival, you know, of that organism, you know, under the conditions that they're in. So that kind of brings us, you know, to this concept of stress physiology, where just basically it's like, number one things that, you know, we're trying to do as an organism are survive and reproduce. And, you know, anything that gets in the way of that, you know, is, is seen as a threat. And, you know, as part of this allostatic process to, uh, you know, adapting and, you know, better sort of surviving a potential future threat. So becoming more robust to that in the future, we, uh, you know, we have a series of chemical processes that, that take place. And those are influenced, those are in initiated and, and augmented by just a like wide, wide array of factors, right? So with, you know, with hypertrophy, it's like, okay, we have some mechanical stimulus, but we also, you know, have the nutri nutritional influences. Uh, we also have like just the biochemical and like hormonal influences inside of our body. We can change that based on our thoughts based on you know how much like acute stress we perceive ourselves to be under so not even necessarily like a real physical threat but even the perception of a threat can change that and all these things are constantly modulating this signal that we for one can't perfectly measure and two don't know exactly how to specifically augment as is so we kind of have this black box of there's some like crazy calculus going on inside of our body with, you know, thousands of different inputs that we cannot measure and we cannot, you know, um, know entirely how to um, specifically augment any one of those stimuli. So the reality for us in the real world, lifting weights and eating food and doing our best to, you know, manage, um, you know, fatigue, is we're using these proxy measures, you know, we're, we're using these, these very, very crude proxy measures that seem to over the long term, you know, result in hypertrophy. And the measurement of that hypertrophy is very crude. And the measurement of what constitutes that signal uh, is very crude. So I think just, you know, from a wide, wide lens, you know, that's where my brain goes. Like there have been studies where there's been a, you know, a study I'm aware of that took untrained people and half the subjects did resistance training, half the subjects took testosterone and the group that took uh, testosterone actually grew more muscle than the group that resistance trained. So again, you know, you have this like chemical signaling takes that takes place that, you know, can be additionally augmented by, you know, a mechanical stimulus, uh, which becomes a chemical signal, but it's not the only thing influencing that. And I think that's, you know, an important point to realize is, you know, 
it may even be many times like the initiation of, of the signaling, but there are a lot of other inputs that almost like, you know, picturing a DJ sort of moving the individual knobs up and down that, you know, can influence, you know, um, sort of how much, like where, uh, you know, and, and, and how much that, that signal is, is, uh, you know, sort of perceived. Yeah. And so I think, I think a good sort of starting point then is like, in terms of our ability to control things in the gym, what that fundamental um, interruption signal we're sort of looking at is, is like our interaction with, you know, something physical, right? Our interaction with force. And so we kind of start with gravity and then we say, well, uh, the fact that we are under the influence of gravitational force will dictate that when we interact with objects, objects impose force on us, we impose force on objects. And that is kind of like this fundamental um, unit of stress that we're able to actually control is, is force. And then specifically like how we actually interact with that force to attempt to yield some kind of outcome. And the important thing to contextualize uh, here, which you just did was, um, that is, that is sort of what we're attempting to control from an exercise standpoint, but that there are all these other complicated influences that will, will also dictate sort of, uh, the, the second, third order consequence of whatever that actually does. And a good point to sort of draw is like, if someone is bedridden for two weeks, four weeks, right, you, you see essentially what happens when people, uh, stop interacting even at a very basic level with these different kinds of forces, right? Like merely going from being in bed all day to standing up to once or twice, you know, within a given day, uh, that could be, you know, a considered uh, progressive overload for that person. So uh, an important contextualized uh, uh, part of the conversation is that it always will depend on sort of like what the reference point is. Uh, and this is especially important, of course, in a rehab setting or in the case of like injury risk management, where we're actually looking at how we can, you know, at what level do we need to interact with these fundamental physics to actually yield an adaptation? And this is kind of like um, so somewhat uh, tangential, but I do think it's relevant that like you mentioned earlier, the concept of a bullshit meter. I think what we're tending to see more and more as research, you know, and being quote science based becomes more popular is this over reliance on what people think that they're observing through research versus a reliance on these fundamental principles. Because for example, like if you, you know, I, I, I talked about the other day um, through, through a post, this concept of a dumbbell pullover. And I was describing this to you the other day, basically how, you know, the mechanics are not really um, specifically uh, we'll say optimized for, uh, you know, training the lats. And I laid out all the reasons for that and the very specific X's and O's of like, well, this motion is occurring as a consequence of these forces. So instead, what you would want to do is this thing over here because it's more specific. And of course, a lot of the response to that was like, well, do you have a specific study to show me um, that that is actually the case. And my point is this, and this is crazy, right? But my my case, is, my argument here is like, you actually don't need an outcome to necessarily show you that that might be the case. And while that outcome observed in research may actually provide, uh, we'll say, uh, more evidence to support a particular claim, you need to understand that what you see in that outcome is an amalgamation of so many different factors that are not just related to the physics of the exercise. So if we were just talking about like, what is this exercise better or worse for in terms of what specifically you're trying to recruit in, in an exercise, you can always just go to the physics, right? And assuming the physics are correct, you sort of almost eliminate in some ways the noise that is associated with um, uh conducting a research study, such as where are the participants coming from? How are they executing the exercise? Is everyone doing it the same way? Are they doing it with a different amount of resistance in this position? Are they doing it with uh, a different you know, degree of shoulder rotation? Because that can change things, right? So I almost think that in terms of exercise analysis and the first principles conversation, to some degree, you almost have to ignore what certain bits of research say. Um, uh, 
to be able to actually start to have, you know, the specific exercise conversation to begin with, right? If you just jump to, well, do we have, you know, the specific evidence that points to saying that what you're saying is true? It's like, we actually do. We just don't have a specific study, you know, that, that shows us that this is the particular outcome. So unlike in nutrition, where maybe, you know, I mean, of course, there are tons of different complicating variables in nutrition as well. You know, we have a lot of data um, showing different outcomes with different kinds of nutritional strategies, but we really do not have a lot of data in the exercise realm that can sort of confidently or allow us to confidently make exercise decisions. But what we do have is something even better, which are these fundamental pr principles of force and of, of physics that can allow us to, you know, make certain selections that are more, um, specific. If that makes sense. Cool. Um, so you kind of started with, so the, you know, uh, for those who are maybe not super familiar with the the fundamental physics stuff, like in the course, I lay out really three uh, super important properties of of force, uh, of of which there are technically like seven or or nine, depending on like what you're reading. But I think the 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 place to really start with, you know, um, in, in, when looking at any exercise, are the first two things, which are like. What is the location of the force? Meaning like, where is it contacting you and where is it interacting with you? Is it in your hand? Is it on your arm? Is it like sort of wrapped around you in a cuff? Uh, is it something, you know, is it a pad on a machine? Is it your foot on the ground? Is it your foot on a machine? And then the second thing is the direction of that force. So without even getting to necessarily the magnitude or the amount of the force, you can kind of just look at, okay, what are, what are the points of application in terms of where am I touching something? And then which directions are those forces shoving me? Those are kind of the main two sort of bread and butter things that that I start with. And in reference to the point of application bit of it, um, you mentioned that sort of the analogy to that was like, okay, which tissues are we trying to target to begin with? So did you want to expand just a little bit on, on that analogy, sort of starting with like point of application and how, you know, we can sort of go about deciding like which, which tissues we want to sort of target to begin with and then how we might set something up depending on that? Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the phrase like all models are wrong, you know, but, but some are useful. So I just happened to be going through your course and I thought this was as good of a model to use as any just for fun. So I said, let me see if I can, you know, kind of take this basic structure, you know, of like what constitutes a force, uh, you know, which is ultimately like imposing a, a stress on the body. And, you know, all, all stresses are going to sort of share, um, you know, some similarities, much, much like you described with force, where it's like, okay, there is uh, a specific point in this case like a specific you know tissue that we're influencing so like where is that stress being placed like is the target of that stress uh your heart is the target of that stress you know your vascular your respiratory you know uh your visual or in this case you know skeletal muscle right so obviously all these things are interacting together but for us typically the goal is specific tissues and, you know, when we're laying out a program, we split it into, you know, X amount of body parts and we say, all right, you know, these exercises are targeting, you know, these muscle groups and we want to do, you know, this much of it. So it starts with being able to sort of uh, break the, the body down and sort of draw, you know, some, some meaningful but somewhat arbitrary lines uh, between tissues and to say like, this is the goal of what we're trying to train, knowing that, you know, it's never truly isolated to that point, but ideally that point is, is sort of like the rate limiter, or, you know, as I often say. So we have to identify like, what are we trying to tr stress? We're trying to cause an adaptation to skeletal muscle tissue. Okay, which tissues, uh, the, uh, the lats, and uh, maybe like, you know, which direction of fibers within the lats, Okay, now it's, you know, the thoracic fibers. All right, so now which direction, uh, you know, would we potentially want to set up this exercise in to, to bias those fibers? So now we know what specifically we're trying to train. And as you mentioned, then there's sort of like a direction component. I think more aptly for this discussion, it would, instead of like just saying direction, it would probably be like uh, the type you know, of stimulus. So you have like a, a specific, um, 
location, you know, specific tissue that we're trying to train, that is the point of application or the where, and the how would simply be like, what is the type of stimulus? So, you know, whether it be an eccentric, an isometric, a concentric, uh, or it be influenced by um, a shorter or longer rest period, which may influence sort of what's happening metabolically. It may be the position uh, that we're training that tissue, uh, where sort of like the most resistance is placed on that tissue, say like a long position or a short position. And, you know, the options are kind of endless here, and it hasn't really been fully elucidated uh, how different types of stresses necessarily lead to uh, specific adaptations at the muscle. And for the large, you know, for the, for the most part right now, it's like, okay, we're observing this kind of net outcome of hypertrophy, and we don't necessarily know, okay, this specific type of training is causing this adaptation here. And if we put this one before the next one. So a lot of the um, practical application of the type component here comes down to just like uh, what's practical, what is enjoyable, what makes sense for the specific exercise that we're doing. Um, and then that last component, like you mentioned, uh, you know, is the magnitude. And again, uh, you kind of know it when you see it, where you're just like, okay, this is more, you know, and we, we, we arbitrarily define something that we call like, okay, this is a unit, you know, this is a unit that we call a set. This is a concept that we call failure. But again, it still kind of lives in a somewhat arbitrary land, but we want to be able to, you know, have some marker where we can say like, this thing is more than that thing. So one example of, you know, how volume is typically measured would just be in like number of difficult sets. But as we well know, you know, not all sets are created equal. Uh, sets of two different exercises are difficult to compare. Um, sets um, with, you know, even the same exercise, but a different setup or a different execution or a different proximity to failure uh, different rest periods, all these things influence, you know, what constitutes, uh, you know, a unit of volume and a, and a unit of stress. And then even within this concept of like, okay, it's a hard set and, you know, we say, okay, it's X amount of reps from failure, or we're going to actually say it's two failure so we can compare apples to apples. And we, and we think that's apples to apples, but even within that, what we call failure is entirely predetermined by like the construct we set up you know so what is the resistance profile of the exercise what kind of anchoring do we have set up for the exercise do we have uh some sort of like external assistance is it done with free weights or is it done with some sort of machine can i change the load while i'm doing it can the machine automatically change the load and, and it can be endless in a sense you know the the a, a simple uh, example would be like a flywheel where there really is no, you know, distinct failure point. It's just like the more force you put into it concentrically, the more you get eccentrically and you can just kind of do that as long as you want. Uh, isokinetics, another example where it's just like, it's moving no matter what, and you just push on it as hard as you can, you know, a, a tonal device now, um, will just keep decreasing the resistance as you get weaker and weaker. Uh, even electrical stimulation will be different than um, your sort of like uh, conscious output. Um, so there's all these different, you know, really definitions of failure. But the reality, like you were mentioning before with like a research study where, yeah, if someone's on bed rest and they go for a walk, uh, even someone who's considered, you know, sedentary in a study, if they start cycling, they'll build muscle. Um we sort of know like that's not the community that we're speaking to here. When we talk about a research study with like, you know, college age participants, you, you kind of have a broad picture of like, okay, when they say 10 to 20 sets, we, we form a picture in our mind of like what type of equipment they're using for it, like what kind of effort they're putting in. And then you, you sort of have to like interpret where do you fit on that spectrum? Like, are you, you know, 170 pound, um, you know, college age, male who squats, you know, 1.7 times their body weight, 
And, you know, are you under the conditions that they are, you know, in a research lab with, um, you know, basically trainers yelling at you to do sets? Um, when you watch other people train in the gym, how does that look compared to how you train? Uh, you know, all, all these factors and then kind of then take your actual experience of, you know, your perceptions of fatigue, doing your best job to sort of measure muscle growth. And we put that all, you know, in it's okay. He's muddled. <laughs> we put that all, you know, into this equation and do our best to try to make, you know, uh, a broad guess here. But um, that that's kind of my summary of, you know, how I broke down these, uh, you know, components of force um, and, and how we could relate that back to like what constitutes a hypertrophy stimulus. So the, the point of application, which tissues are we trying to train the type of stimulus, uh, that, you know, we're uh, engaging in or, you know, inflicting on those specific tissues. And then, you know, the magnitude of that stimulus, like how difficult is it and how much are you doing? Yeah. So I want to dive into the, the, cause the magnitude section is a little bit of a bigger section that can sort of get tangential very quickly. So I want to first just kind of lay out my framework for like um, the first couple of things. And I think the, one of the things I want to start with is just, you need to start <clears throat> your exercise decision-making process with a goal in mind, right? So that is always step one is like, okay, if I don't have a map, uh, for, for sort of like what I'm trying to do, if I don't have a destination that I have no idea, my GPS has no idea whether I'm going, you know, to Antarctica or whether I'm trying to go to, you know, to Florida, right? So begin with the end in mind. And that sort of needs to start with, in this case, like what a specific tissue is, right? Um, so that's thing number one. Thing number two from that point would be like, okay, well, we need to, as a consequence of identifying the tissue, identify where it is, on the body and then what it does when it contracts. So uh, a clear cut example of this to use to sort of ride along with the example you gave is like, let's let's imagine we're, we're talking about the lats and for now let's not differentiate between the different parts of the lats and what they might do, right? So the first thing we can say is, well, the lats uh, attach basically all along the spine and the hips and they run up into the arm, meaning that the lats attach on the back side of the body and they attach to the arm. So what that means is that when they contract, they basically pull the arm backward in a variety of directions in addition to pulling the shoulder girdle backward in a variety of directions. So, so if you can identify the tissue, where it is, and then what happens when it contracts, you can know that you need a direction of resistance that is essentially trying to get you to not do that, right? So um, if anyone can sort of imagine this, like if you were just sitting, sitting down and you held your arms out in front of you and someone just pulled your arms forward, right? That would be a direction of resistance, like a chest supported row, like a cable row, like a pull down at varying angles where your arms would be essentially pulled off of your body forward or pulled off of your body upward in a variety of directions. So that would be something that would be appropriate to the goal of starting to move in the direction of a lat related stimulus. Stimulus. So you start from goal, you identify tissue, you identify the direction that the tissue would move the body when it contracts. And then from there you say, okay, what direction of resistance would I need to sort of start to recruit this? And many people just start with like, oh, I see row, I think back, or I see press, I think chest, right? But what sort of underlies those things to begin with? Like what allows us to even arrive at those places in the first place? is or are these fundamental concepts of like, what is the resistance doing to me and how do I have to respond to that? So, you know, what makes a bench press a bench press and what makes a bench press for your packs and for your delts and for your triceps are the different kinds of resistance uh, that we have to essentially act against in order to basically not just fall apart and into a pile, uh, into a pile of goop, right? So to sort of continue uh, along that path, then we have to start to ask like, well, okay, if I if I pick an exercise with that appropriate direction of resistance, you know, another good example, which is maybe a little bit more concrete for, for people to imagine, like if your goal is to target your biceps and you know that your biceps bring your forearm closer to your upper arm, then you know that you need a resistance that is essentially trying to pry your forearm away from your upper arm. Right? So that's a good way to think about it is based around really what happens when the muscle shortens. And to some degree, there's no way around 
you know, needing to just understand the basic anatomy when it comes to that stuff. There's no like shortcut that you can take to, to know where a muscle is. And it could be a quick Google search. It could be you having an app, right? If you're trying to apply this stuff for the first time in, in, in the gym and you're maybe not so sure about like what certain muscles do, where they attach. Um, but those are the things that you need to start with. And then from there, again, you apply that direction of resistance. And then you start to ask yourself like, okay, well, if I know that I want this muscle to be the thing in this exercise, then I know that at least uh, for the most part, it needs to be a rate limiter, right? You use that, that term rate limiter. And really what that means to me is, uh, is sort of in the term itself is like, um, when that motion stops or when I fatigue in that motion, when I can start to do less of that thing, um, I need to make sure that the tissue that I'm trying to train is the thing that is stopping the motion from happening, right? So two examples maybe in, in the sort of lat related conversation. One option might be like you're doing a barbell row, right? So you're sort of hinged over and you have a barbell in your hands and you're doing a row. From the first principles, you know, sort of analysis, you can say, well, okay, I know where my lats are, I know what they do, and I'm loading myself in a direction that makes sense to, to, to load the lats. But now all of a sudden you have other things to consider, right? Because the body is one thing. It's all, you know, joints, joints essentially connect bones and, you know, all the way from your hands to your feet, you have some degree of connection. So loading any part of your body in essence will load most parts of your body, right? So you can't just ignore all of the other joints and all the other muscles that may be involved in that particular motion. So if you start with the, the force, the first principle stuff and you end up at a barbell row, despite the fact that you may have set something up that's reasonably appropriate for that goal, you you have to now consider what other influences may play a role in being able to create a rate limiter in that exercise. So in the example of a barbell row, I may end up in a position where my glutes and my hamstrings feel like they're super fatigued first. I may end up in a position where my erectors and my and my spinal extensors feel like they're kind of, you know, having to endure a lot of the load. Or I may end up in a position where my upper back muscles, right, feels like my traps and my rear delts and maybe my biceps are sort of taking over the motion. And that doesn't necessarily require a super specific force analysis, um, but, um, you, you, you certainly could go that direction. I think a lot of people intuitively can get the sense uh, of when an exercise is really hyper-specific and when it starts to deviate toward much more generalized, like, eh, I'm just feeling a lot of stuff right now and it's not really exactly what I imagine to be targeting. So in the example of a barbell row, we may be able to create a situation that would be more ideal for loading you know, the lats specifically if we had something to support our torso and to support our hips so that those things wouldn't potentially introduce a, a rate limiter in that motion. So instead of doing a barbell row, I might say, okay, I'm going to use this machine that has a space for me to both sit and to be supported you know, on the front side of my body so that the only thing that I know that can really be fatiguing are just stuff on the backside, my pullers, right? The things that are pulling my arms backward behind my body and actually resisting the, um, the load directly. So you jump from barbell barbell row, right, where you may introduce limiters at the hip and spine in addition to the to the upper arms, um, to something that now only really allows for one rate limiter, and that sort of comes about through uh, introducing other things that are, uh, we'll say. Uh, anchors or external stability um, that would allow us to be more specific. So from the sort of beginning of identifying the tissue, identifying the resistance, we then go to, okay, well, how specific actually is this thing, given that I have those previous, uh, you know, principles applied appropriately. So the concept of a rate limiter is interesting because, you know, if you're training someone for the first time and you're introducing uh, a new exercise, generally speaking, it's in, in, in my experience specifically, it's a lot easier to teach people how to exercise when they have fewer things to have to manage and consider. Um, and so in the context of, of the barbell row example, you know, by definition, they'll have to sort of be able to coordinate a lot of stuff around the hips and the knees, and they'll have to coordinate a lot of stuff around the spine rather than just being able to focus on one thing at a time. So I think that's something that's especially uh, important for trainers to understand in the context of this stuff is like, yeah, we have these like really specific 
um, hypertrophy goals in mind and, and strength goals. But we also have this concept of like being able to easily make something a rate limiter because you don't want to end up in a position where you're doing an exercise that in theory does a lot of things, but then as a consequence of, of that kind of does nothing more specifically, right? Sort of like the, um, you know, a million birds and like, you know, no stones or whatever the, whatever the phrase is, like the opposite of two birds, one stone, right? It's like, it's like many birds, you know, and I throw a stone and I don't hit any birds. <laughs> you know what stones, I'm trying to say. Many stones, no birds. Yeah. Many stones, no birds. Right, right. So, um, you know, where I sort of go next with it is like, is this scenario that I'm trying to create appropriate, appropriately set up, you know, within the confines of those first principles um, at a level which is appropriate to, to the goal? And in the case of the rowing motion, it's my contention that we should essentially make sure that nothing else is rate limiting the motion first. And then maybe if we want to introduce... Um, exercises that are more sort of multi-joint, if you want to call it that, or involve more moving parts, then at least we have a sense of like, what should this feel like for this particular goal? Whereas if you start with the opposite, where they have a thousand things to manage, there's no real sense of like, what a rate limiting exercise should actually feel like, right? We all have probably experienced that before where you end an exercise and it's like, ah, I kind of have a pump in my hamstrings, but like my spine is also fatigued, but like my upper back and my lats also feel kind of like, you know, stimulated a, a, as well. So um, I just wanted to make sure we covered uh, that sort of thought process and my framework for how I, I lay things out. And it, it's important to note that um, with the whole anchoring concept, the goal of the anchoring concept is really to uh, always, always be specific about the application, right? So in the example of the chest supported row, um, that's an that's that's a specific scenario that I would set up to optimize for the goal of let me make my lats a rate limiter. But if you have a different goal, which is less specific or which is more sort of like, let me do a lot of these things at once and you're and you feel competent in being able to do that, there's nothing wrong with that. And, and so it's important to point out that, you know, using external stability is not like a more is better situation. It's like what is appropriate in terms of the forces that I'm dealing with to accomplish again, that initial thing that I had laid out um, for myself. So just in terms of that overall framework, did that kind of make sense? Um, and did you have any sort of follow-ups uh, to that process? Yeah, I mean, the one counter I, I could see coming up that probably is like the the, the usual, uh, you know, retort to this is like, well, <clears throat> something being a rate limiter in an exercise isn't requisite in terms of building muscle. So yeah. it's like, just like the, the analogy or, or, or the um, example you gave earlier of like, all right, if you're going out for a walk and you know, you've been bedridden, like that might be enough. So it is still that kind of black box of like, well, what is enough? Like what is kind of the threshold that's necessary? Is it, you know, at this moment, what we call failure, uh, um, you know, for this day, for this exercise at this moment in time, is it five reps from failure, 10 reps from failure, you know, where are the hamstrings uh, on a bent over row in relationship to that? You know, how do we compare, you know, what they're doing isometrically to failure on, you know, an RDL, right? Like there really is no comparison, but we know that it still results, you know, in some uh, hypertrophy as well. So the argument may be like, well, you know, from an efficiency standpoint, efficiency being time, uh, maybe I can get more done, you know, with less time. But to your point, it's like, if you're teaching something, um, you know, to, to a, a beginner who doesn't know how to manage any of these things, trying to manage, you know, multiple components simultaneously is going to be much more difficult to learn than just one of them. And then on the opposite side of the spectrum, like as um, the, the requisite amount of stress to, to sort of signal for adaptation goes up and up, uh, it may be very you know, inefficient to try to achieve uh, that requisite amount of stress for a specific tissue um, by doing things that are very indirect. You know, mm -hmm. you're not going to see bodybuilders say, well, you know, my hamstrings um, are my weak body part. So I'm going to add in more bent over rows, you know, like that, that would never be the solution to that problem. So 
I think in, in practice, like that we generally aren't moving uh, in a direction of using less specific and more like general exercises to add, you know, stimulus to a body part. It may be something you consider, um, something you build into the equation. Certainly when you're looking at the research on like bicep and tricep training, they count all the sets from backs. So you're like, oh, this is a 30 set bicep study. When in reality they did like, you know, 10, 15 sets of biceps, you know, direct work. And then they did pull downs, you know, and, and rows from all different sorts of, um, you know, positions at the, you know, wrist and, and shoulder, right? So it's not that you do not stimulate hypertrophy if that particular muscle uh, isn't a rate limiter. It's just um, in terms of like being most direct and um, most stimulative within a given you know unit of time um knowing how to make something a rate limiter uh is, is a valuable tool to have and you know understanding kind of like again coming back to that magnitude like what is the difference in magnitude between something that's you know working isometrically if we say like oh you know the <clears throat> the the deadlift you know is the best exercise you know to build your lats or something like that, right? You hear a statement like that and you go back again to first principles and say, well, does that really, does that really check out? You know, like, are they getting no stimulus? No, but based on, you know, what I know about what the lats do and, you know, looking at the evidence as far as like, um, you know, isometric versus concentric and eccentric stress, again, coming back to that, you know, point of application, type of stress, you know, is that going to be, you know, the most stimulative way uh, that, that we can work the lats. And uh, I think that's where this stuff kind of comes into play, where it's just like evaluating, uh, you know, a statement like that. Like, this is the best thing for this. And we can say, all right, you know, what is the tissue we're trying to train? What is the way that it's being trained, uh, you know, in, in this uh, specific scenario? And then, you know, what's the magnitude? Yeah. And I think a big part of my, you know, um, contention in the direction of being more specific with exercise selection and more specific with creating rate limiters is exactly that point, which is like, we don't exactly know where to draw the line with those kinds of like combined exercises. And so it's not that those couldn't do something. It's just that if I want to be really, really sure that I'm doing what I set out to do, that there are only so many different ways that I can do that. And there are only so many ways that I can, you know, set that up. And obviously it, it falls along a spectrum of like, well, how different is it going to be for someone to do a dumbbell curl in standing versus a dumbbell curl in standing with something behind their arm? It's like, you know, those two things can only be so different as compared to doing like a chest supported thing uh, in comparison to like a barbell row. So always like a case by case um uh, situation, situation, like you're saying. Um, and, and I do think from a personal training standpoint that, you know, just to kind of remove the friction of learning exercises to begin with is very helpful. Uh, even if you just think about it from like a trainer client relationship, like if someone is just having an easier time learning exercises, generally speaking, the dynamic between trainer and coach is, you know, you can just tend to focus on like relationship building rather than having to spend the whole session, like trying to be super nuanced and specific about like, okay, keep your hips here and keep your knees here. And like, you know, just giving someone a thousand different things to kind of focus on and, and, and ponder. I think that can do a lot for like buy-in as well when you're trying to work with someone who does have a, a very specific goal. Um, like I'm sure you've had clients like this where, you know, they'll point to a specific muscle or they'll name a muscle group and they'll be like, I want to grow this thing. You know, there, there's a tremendous amount of, of subjective buy-in that you can gain from just under, from knowing how to, how to create specific rate limiters as well. So I think it has other sorts of, you know, tangential benefits that are not just purely outcome uh, related uh, that are more related to the acute um, sort of positive association with exercise and learning exercise and those kinds of things. So um, one of the, so the sort of magnitude piece is where things start to kind of expand uh, in terms of the, um, you know, how the, the first principles sort of apply to different scenarios. 
And one of the things that you briefly mentioned earlier was just this conversation around uh, proximity to failure and specifically the idea that failure is kind of this, in some ways, subjective construct uh, that we that we denote as an arbitrary line in the sand. So can you kind of just expand a little bit, maybe in in practice, like how you go about actually addressing this 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 problem of like identifying what failure is and where each client can sort of land on the spectrum of like needing to train more or less to failure. Uh, and I'll preface that with saying that I don't think that everyone needs to train to failure. I don't think that a lot of people can train to failure. Uh, especially if we're, if we're just dealing with like normal people. So if we can kind of start by just defining failure, because failure to me and like effort really is what we're talking about is sort of the next step on this, on this hierarchy of like, okay, I have my goal. I have my exercise selection based on these first principles. Now within the context of that exercise, outside of just the skills and developing the skills themselves, like how much, how much effort do I put into that thing? Um, that it, to me is kind of the next uh, 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 question. And obviously that will depend on the selection that we make. But can you talk a little bit more about this idea of um, of failure? And specifically, I like what you wrote down for me here, um, which was the idea that, uh, yeah, you said failure is, is entirely a construct of, you know, equipment manipulation, um, you know, sort of imagining a machine with that sort of perfectly anchored scenario with the resistance directions that are perfectly set up for the goal, um, you know, and, and sort of how that can maybe influence um, uh, effort as a whole. So just first sort of just like to lay out and maybe a more solid question is like, how can we go about defining failure in a way that is not so esoteric that we end up just talking about like all the theoretical based stuff? Um, you know, how do you go about defining failure, like on a client, uh, sort of one-on-one -on -one basis and, and for yourself in your own training. Yeah. So I think it, it still kind of like circles back to having those first two things in place. Yeah. And the first two things aren't in place. That's kind of where fail, where the line of failure is created. So like you mentioned, that point of application is, is setting the goal. So if we say these, this is the tissue or these are the tissues that I'm trying to train, we now have created um, a more well-defined like um, uh, exercise. We, we, we can imagine like what the exercise looks like now. And we say, all right, like this is the direction that we're going to train in. Uh, these, you know, are the tissues that we're, we're trying to train. So this is sort of like the joint motion that I want to go through. And that start that starts to form the constraints of the exercise. And if those constraints ever become broken, you you are not you have now failed within you know the limitations we've set up. So the goal is to train these tissues. In order to train these tissues, we must go through these motions with resistance in the appropriate direction, and you know um, sort of at, even at the appropriate times, you know, in, in sort of magnitudes throughout that. Uh, throughout that path of motion. So with those, you know, constraints already set up, if the person starts moving in a way where they shift that stress to different tissues, so they change their execution, they have now failed within the constraints we've set forth. Mm, yeah, so, so give an example of that. Yeah, so an example might be like you're doing, um, you know, a chest press, where it's intended to, you know, be like a, a um, let, let's make it like a clavicular, uh, you know, so sort of like an incline press. And we really want to bias like the upper fibers of the pecs and, you know, front delts, knowing that maybe we get a little bit of, you know, tricep, a little bit of, you know, all the pec fibers, especially in the lengthened position. But then maybe as the set goes on, the person starts to fatigue. What they do is like, uh, really start to arch their back and now the thing that's you know on top and the thing that's most aligned with the uh, resistance is maybe more of the like lower fibers uh, of their packs or maybe they drop their sternum they really start to push their shoulders forward and now it becomes more of this like rib cage movement like tricep lockout 
kind of exercise where it's like, okay, the goal here was to, mo you know, to have the upper pack fibers as the limiter, but now we've changed that where it's no longer the thing that is, uh, you know, fatiguing. We've now moved it either to, you know, different pack fibers. We moved it to tricep or on the, you know, in the other resistance direction, maybe you're doing a row. And when you start to fatigue, it becomes more of a back extension. Then it becomes, you know, a, a movement at the shoulder. And, you know, maybe there is a time and place. If you've defined ahead of time, like I'm going to manipulate my body position so that I can change, you know, where the exercise is heavy, or I'm going to bring on another muscle to sort of like help me out of a certain position so that I can fail with the, you know, intended muscle in another position. That may be a constraint that you put forth, you know, before uh, the start of an exercise where it's like, well, I can still keep tension, you know, on the, you know, goal muscle that I'm trying to work here, but maybe what another person calls perfect form, you know, is something that actually changes throughout the set. So it just starts with like, what tissues are we trying to train and, you know, how do we need to move to, uh, you know, train those tissues uh, sort of most optimally at every point uh, during the set. And if you break those rules, you've now failed at, you know, the constraints you, you've set for. So that's one way to look at it. Just looking at like the first point there, like, are you still staying true to the original goal? And then, you know, and the I, second. And I think one thing to add there is just like a lot of people will go the direction of, well, I can do more reps you know, if I, if I start changing it this way. So if you do have a goal set forth, uh, which, which is to fatigue X muscle, uh, and then you change the execution by definition, you have now, um, you have now moved away from, from, from that goal and are now accomplishing, you know, something else. And then we, of course, we could talk about like how you said, changing execution might be part of the equation that we've already laid forth. But in many cases, uh, it, it, it won't be. So, yeah, I think I think that's an important point to put out is that you may be able to do more reps, but those reps may be uh, attributing to a completely different stimulus than you had in, initially laid out or compared to the stimulus you initially laid out. Yeah. And in practice, you know, the people who are doing that are usually doing that short of the point where the intended muscle uh has you know can no longer achieve the range of motion like the goal range of motion that you've set forth mm -hmm. right so that's where it's like the you know personal training client that maybe you were describing um where you don't want them to train to failure because maybe when they train to failure they change their execution and maybe that has an influence on their injury risk historically or maybe um when they change position, it's simply just to get away from the local discomfort of the muscle that they're trying to train. So you're just trying to get them to practice more and more like uh, maintaining execution and just getting, you know, comfortable with the uncomfortable, so to speak. So that may be where this like second component of just like the, you know, type of stress, uh, the direction of, of, of stress uh, the just sort of specificity of like, okay, now what are we, what are we doing to this tissue? Is it, you know, a 30 rep set of leg extensions that feels very different than a 30 rep set of squats. Like both of them feature a lot of local muscular fatigue, but one might have a lot of like, uh, you know, cardiorespiratory, cardio, you know, metabolic fatigue, like in a systemic sense, which, you know, is going to feel very different than, you know, a three rep set of squats and you know we may program very differently if we're doing sets of three you know versus sets of 20 versus you know sets of three with a 30 second rest in between um so all of these like um you know variables that go into the the type of stimulus are also things that may determine you know where the ultimate failure point is so it may just be that like for example, with the rest period example, it may be that if you did a set of 10 to failure and you rested, you know, three minutes that on the next set to failure, you're able to get eight reps. Whereas if you rested, you know, one minute, maybe you're only able to get five reps. You know, both of those give the, um, 
appearance of failure. Both of them are failure in the sense that you can't complete this goal of moving, in this case, the leg extension, you know, to the fully knee extended position, or maybe the constraint you set out is I'm not going to do any more reps once I literally can't extend my knee at all. And that's the constraint you set for. So failure is maybe looks like a couple partial reps at the end of the set. And that's what you're calling failure. Um, you know, if that's a constraint you set forward and you say you shorten the rest period, you may end up with, you know, mo you know, considerably less reps with a shorter rest period. So now all of a sudden you still have failure, but like, did you fail for the same reasons? And how does that ultimately influence uh, muscle growth? And, and some of these answers or most of these answers are, um, you know, not things we know with certainty, but they are things you can experiment certainly, you know, on your own. And I would say just as a general rule, like if you're able to get, you know, under all of the same constraints, more output, in this case, you know, more reps, you're probably getting more stimulus, even if it's not, you know, dramatically. more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think a really good recent example to kind of describe in practice or in research what, you know, how, how drastic these differences can be is this recent study um, for, for quads where, you know, one group ended up doing like 52 sets, um, you know, by the end of the study uh, on, on average within a given time frame, And then another group ended up doing like, you know, a 25% of that. And you see that outcomes between those two, I think based on what the, the study was reporting was that, um, and you can correct me here, uh, outcomes were either not very different between groups uh, with drastically different volumes. And in some cases where, uh, you know, people actually were seeing better results with, with drastically lowered uh, volumes. And it's like, just by definition, if you're going to do 50 sets of something within a week, those sets can't be, you know, the same as if you were to do uh, a quarter of that volume, right? Like if you do 10 sets a week versus 50 sets a week, it's like all the things that go into deciding what a set is, have to be very different, like rest time, like load that you use, um, length of session, all those different uh, uh, kinds of things. Um, so I think that a good sort of talking point here now within the context, just for a second, staying on uh, like proximity to failure is to, is to sort of loop in one of the, uh, the, the member um, questions here, which was Emmanuel had this essentially this question about like uh, lengthened uh, work and specifically like stretch mediated hypertrophy. And one of the things that he brought up, which is something that is being talked a lot now, is this conversation around like certain muscles seem to be growing from uh, uh, lengthened work more than others. And so what that might indicate is that there's some unique property of the specific muscle uh, that allows it to grow more. So the conversation ends up being this one about like, which muscles grow from stretch mediated hypertrophy and like which muscles don't grow more from stretch mediated hypertrophy. And I think in some ways, uh, that kind of framing almost misses the point, uh, from like a first principle standpoint, because rather than it being about a specific and unique property to every muscle, I think it usually ends up being just an artifact or a consequence of the way that you're doing a particular exercise. So for example, um, people are currently saying that the lats do not benefit from stretch mediated hypertrophy, when in reality, it might simply just be the case that training your back it, it, with more load in a lengthened position tends to be more difficult to do than training your pecs, for example, with load that's heavier in a more lengthened position. So the question kind of went toward like, what are the factors that that influence whether a muscle is, you know, better in a lengthened or shortened position in terms of just output that it can create? And then, you know, is it some kind of, is it something that's related to the fibers or some kind of other physiologic effect? And my contention is, well, all tissues might theoretically grow more from exercises that are loaded in more lengthened positions, but the ones that we're seeing manifest in research are usually the ones that end up just being more convenient to set up with resistance where we're stronger.
So a good example might be a dumbbell press, which is mechanically heaviest at the bottom. That's a very easy thing to set up. But if you're doing a cable row or a cable pull down, you have to be very intentional about the way that you execute the exercise and then the specific amount of load that you choose, right? Because you may use a, a, a specific load. Let's say you can use a hundred pounds and you can execute 10 reps just in the top half of the range. And then to get all the way to the bottom, you all of a sudden have to use 60 pounds or 70 pounds. Like those two things are very distinct scenarios. So I'm not exactly sure where to take this question beyond that. I don't know if you have any additional um, insights or thoughts about it, but I usually take all of the more specific, um, you know, like terminology based questions like stretch mediated hypertrophy related stuff back to just like, um, how can we use the first principles of the exercise selection stuff to answer this? Um, and part of the, part of this that ties into the failure conversation is like, well, if you're doing an exercise, which is much heavier, where you're stronger, failure looks very different than if you're doing an exercise where you're, um, you know, you're loading it much more where you're weaker, you know, so a good contrast might be like a leg extension that has the capacity to sort of change where it's heavy, um, versus one that you don't have the ability to change. Many of them, for example, are much harder in the top where mechanically, uh, you're much, much weaker for a variety of reasons. So failure may look different depending on a lot of different things, but primarily where, you know, in, a, in the range of motion that you're using, the resistance is, is heaviest. And that's something that you brought up in the context of failure, which is that failure may look very different depending on the resistance that you're using in its direction. Uh, and I think that's, it's cool that it sort of just ties back into the, where we started this, which was like, start with, you know, the goal and then figure out what to do with the resistance. So does anything come up for you uh, in the context of that framing? The first thing that comes up for me is that like, I feel like the terminology stretch mediated hypertrophy and the concept of like length and partials being, uh, you know, potentially more effective than like, you know, short position partials, uh, that those, you know, are the same thing. Um, I mean, I doubt that they are, um, you know, we haven't like, you know, fully elucidated what the mechanisms are, but at least, um, from what we do have, there isn't like a real reason to believe that they're the same thing. You know, I think the studies that are looking at like long duration stretches for like at least an hour, uh, you know, at least several times a week or, you know, studies in animals where they're loaded, you know, 24 seven in a stretch. I think it's a big leap to assume that that is sort of the same mechanism that we see with like uh, the advantage of length and partials. But I think the terminology gets crossed over a lot. And then, you know, when we start using the word like stretch, you know, and, and we're talking about resistance training versus, you know, like a shortening and lengthening, it kind of takes away that concept of contraction. So I think the first thing I would do is just like separate the idea of like, you know, stretching and, you know, resistance training where uh, the position and the uh, resistance, you know, are, um, you know, specifically in, in the length and position. Uh, after that, I really don't know what evidence, like, for example, when you say with the lats, you know, people are hypothesizing the lats might not respond well. Uh, to my knowledge, you know, there's no studies looking at this question for the lats so i wonder where that thought comes from that some muscles re respond better to others I'm, I'm sure you can look um you know across like uh you know quads biceps triceps hamstrings you know some of the muscles that have been studied so far and maybe see more robust changes in some muscles than others and to your point that may very well have to do with just like the exercise uh selection that, that they're using um, but I don't know where the evidence is coming from, where people are saying that the, the, the lats might not respond. So it's difficult for me to sort of like, uh, you know, have a counter to that because I, I just don't know what, where there would be, you know, strong evidence to support that claim. Um, and it seems like, you know, besides the practical limitation and research of like, um, you know, doing, you know, an ultrasound or like uh, maybe a biopsy or whatever, like MRI, you know, on the lats, it doesn't seem to be a place where you see a lot of uh, 
research being done, you know, looking at like local changes in uh, like cross-sectional area uh, from, you know, what I've heard from researchers, it's just like a difficult place right now for them to study. Um, I just don't think, you know, we have a lot of evidence like looking at those areas. Um, but it seems to me like if there was anything that was going to benefit from the way that I'm looking at it, whereas it's just more of like a constraint of the exercises that we're using, that, you know, the back would probably benefit the most because people are training their chest with exercises that already tend to be heavy, often in the length and position. Um, you know, they're training their hamstrings oftentimes with exercises that tend to be overloaded in the length of position. Same thing, uh, you know, with quads for the most part. But when it comes to back, uh, you know, that seems to be one area consistently where most people don't get that stimulus unless they're, um, you know, in intimately aware uh, of this information. So I would think if anything in practice that the back would probably you know, benefit the most from uh, specifically setting up exercises to be uh, harder in the length and position. Yeah, and one of the so one of uh, the the questions that we had in 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 the group, um, which comes from David, he was asking if we could go over some examples like using rear delt stuff. And I think this is almost it's kind of like proof in the pudding of like why certain muscle groups are maybe more difficult to target than others. It's like, it's just a little bit more practically nuanced to set something up for your rear delt to be super involved in something as compared to something like your chest, right? Or, um, you know, your quads or your hamstrings. And so, you know, it, typically speaking, like people, the rear delt exercise is like the reverse fly on the pec deck. And that a lot of times ends up being uh, a machine that from a comfort standpoint can be uncomfortable for a lot of people just because of the distance between the handle and the shoulder. It could be the angle given that it's just, you know, limited to one plane. And so an example of like applying this to rear delts is like, well, if you follow the first principles of where does it attach, how does it contract and all those things, you would need to have your arm somewhere in front of your body and you would need to have a resistance that's approximately 90 degrees or close to 90 degrees to your arm when your arm is in front of your body, right? And you wouldn't necessarily want to sort of be moving all the way back into this like behind the body territory, which is usually where people end up when they're trying to do rear delt type stuff. It's not that it doesn't act there, but as a proportion in terms of how much it's going to be involved, you know, you're going to be much better off. And David, to, to, your, to your question, um, doing exercises for rear delts that are, that are loaded more when your arm is in front of your body. And when it sort of, you know, stays out in front of your body, you know, a lot of times, um, people try to manipulate, you know, position of the, of the scaps and the clavicles and all those sorts of things. And I think it's usually because they're using resistance that is loading them forward and backward where there by necessity has to be a lot of scat motion right in that front to back sort of a plane so if you can use resistance that's actually loaded you know if you if i'm holding my left hand forward and i have a cable the cable is pulling me directly to the right where almost the cable is like parallel to my torso um you know that's that's a good example of how just something like direction uh, can have a profound influence on what the outcome is because even if you do a reverse fly you know, in the same way, but the cable is pulling you forward or the outcome from that because of the forces can be very, very different. So two motions that, you know, in essence look to be exactly the same can have a very different outcome just by changing that first thing that we talked about in, uh, you know, resistance direction and those kinds of things. So maybe where I kind of want to, um, you know, I, I always say finish up, but who knows uh, how long any particular question could be. It's just maybe something in terms of practical application for, you know, people who are personal trainers and who are looking to um, apply this stuff just pretty concretely, concretely to the context of like a training session. Um, you know, Maddie um, w was specifically asking uh, in the group you know, how this information can kind of apply to the context of like a personal training session where you eventually become limited or very limited on time, you know, so like, for example, a client may come five or 10 minutes late, maybe they're sort of slow to start, they only have this now 45 to 50 minute window. And, you know, we can't necessarily, quote unquote, optimize 
for all the things we've been talking about, you know, how can we sort of navigate a session where maybe we're not able to quote anchor, you know, as much as we might like to, um, and how do we sort of navigate a situation where and all these different variables can just be restrained or constrained by the context of how much time do we have to train? And to start, I think where I kind of start with this is just not assuming that every context is going to be the same in terms of um, you know how we're initially ap applying these principles. So we started out with the conversation around bent over row and chest supported row. It's like, well, you know, if there's 12 different trainers operating at the same time at a gym and half of them are using the chest supported row, you have to kind of make a decision about like, do I want to do the chest supported row or can I do something that is roughly approximating what that goal of the chest supported row would accomplish, right? So in that case, it's like, is a single arm dumbbell row going to be the most stable thing uh, as compared to the chest supported row? No, but if you're someone who is working around constraints of time and constraints of other trainers using the same space, right? All of these things can actually in essence apply to the principles or apply based on the principles that we talked about initially, which was just like, if you know that you have this particular goal of training XYZ muscle, then you don't need to be tied to any one implement. So it's almost like being more principle-based about it allows you to navigate intra-session with a client where you may not have the same options or where you may not have the same you know, uh, uh, time opportunity to maybe optimize things, quote unquote, optimize things where you may be able to be more specific. So I think just a focus on these principles is actually almost what answers these some of these questions to begin with in terms of the time constraint thing, where- when you have these uh, first principles in mind, you can kind of work backward from them rather than working backward from what the ideal thing may theoretically be. And I think that's what, you know, context dependent um, application is all about is just extrapolating information from the first principles so that you can accomplish what you're trying to, even though it might not be the most, you know, optimal or ideal thing for um, any given scenario. So just in terms of the whole time constraint thing, um, do you have any comments on on that uh, just in an overall sense or in just a specific application uh, sense? Yeah, so the time constraints being that like there's only so many times a week this personal training client trains yeah. and you all, you're constrained to like, you know, maybe the hour long session and then you're also constrained to, you know, maybe the gym is busy and you have limited options. So you have to come back to these ideas of like first principle of like, okay, this is the plan we have for the week. And we, within that plan, like these are the muscles we're trying to train and this is how much we're trying to train them. And I mean, once you have that plan laid out, it sounds like it's just going to be trying to like equate stimulus. So it's not like, cause you're, you're not starting off with client walks into the gym. What do I do? Like you're still starting off with, you have a plan ahead of time. You know, if you're not starting with that, you've already lost the battle. So you're still starting off with some preconceived notion or you have prior experience with this person or that person has some prior experience where it's like, okay, we've already set up, like, this is what we're trying to achieve. This is the goal. So then in this particular scenario, I guess it would just be equating, you know, uh, magnitude, you know, more than anything else. Like, I think that was ultimately what it would come down to. And then you're just looking at like, all right, if I was going to, you know, if I was training on my own and I didn't have the time constraints and I wanted to find the single exercise uh, that per rep and per set gave you the me the most stimulus for this muscle um it might take a minute you know to set up i might actually wait for the machine i might take a longer rest period and that might be most efficient on a per rep and per set basis but that may actually not be as efficient on a per unit of time basis mm. so for example, like I was in the gym a few weeks ago training legs and, you know, I was seat belting the leg extension and I have my, you know, handles uh, so that I can, uh, you know, 
reach, uh, you know, some handle, you know, around, around the, <laughs> uh, um, you know, that's my setup there. Okay. You know, do a few warm up sets, you know, I'm training, you know, considerably heavier than most people are on something like that. So maybe there's at least, you know, a couple warm up sets involved. Maybe I got to throw a gym pin in there. You know, there, there's a little bit of, um, a little bit of a process, you know, to do that. Maybe, you know, when I move over to the, um, uh, the hack squat, you know, again, a lot of plates going on there. Maybe there's a, you know, a couple warm up sets involved, but, you know, right now I'm using the BFR cups. That takes a little bit of time to set up. Maybe there's another exercise where you've chosen to use a wedge. And I noticed there was another guy in the gym uh, that, you know, looked like a pretty decent bodybuilder, you know, pretty big difference in terms of just like overall, you know, body weight, muscle mass, but still someone who's clearly had a lot of, you know, success, uh, you know, putting muscle on their frame. And when I watched like the execution of his exercises, it was like, you know, he would do like a, a standing leg curl. And I would notice like oh, most of this is just like spinal extension, just like rolling the pelvis forward. He's using, you know, light weights and he is very far from failure. It kind of made me think like, is this guy like a week out from the show where he's just kind of like doing depletion workouts or something? <laughs> but the dude did like, seven or eight exercises by the time I had finished like three. Mm. Um, and I was like, you know, and I don't rest a long time between sets. You know, again, I might do a couple warm up sets and it might take me a minute, you know, to set up some of these things. But for the most part, unless like you and I are, you know, chatting between sets or something like I, I just, I go in about the amount of time it takes for another person to do a set and then for me to get in, you know, and tighten the seatbelt or whatever. Um, but not a single one of his sets looked more difficult than any of my warm up sets. And also, you know, the stimulus was like one, it was just repeating itself over and over again. It's like standing leg curl to lying leg curl to, you know, a different lying leg curl. Um, so it was like very redundant very like uh non-specific in the sense that there were segments moving joints moving you know that would not necessarily make that intended muscle you know the limiter the effort uh even though you know subjectively to him in terms of facial expressions and everything you know gave the uh perception that it was difficult Clearly, you could see with like the you know velocity that the that the implement was moving, um, that you know he was still pretty far from failure, or that he would he would get to failure maybe because something else was moving, something else became the limiter. So that to me is like you know an example of yeah, you get a lot done in in a certain amount of time, you move really quickly. It's inefficient from the standpoint of like. Uh, the individual rep and the individual set, but you accumulate a ton of work. So I, I think in this case, like you might not be on either end of that extreme spectrum where you're trying to get like the absolute most out of every rep, or you're just being so inefficient that like you can do triple the amount, you know, of sets, but each set only counts, you know, for a, a you know, extremely small magnitude in relation to, you know, what like an ideal set would look like so maybe somewhere in the middle with the first principles is like all right we're going to you know pick an exercise that still is uh making the tissue we're trying to train the rate limiter or close to it um we're not going to necessarily allow from deviate allow deviation you know from that uh setup and execution and, you know, if we're trying to be most efficient, we're going to put the most effort we can in, you know, for every set so that we don't have to do more sets. So it probably looks like something that's relatively low setup time, something that is relatively high effort and something that's uh, relatively shorter rest periods. You don't want the rest periods to be so short that you have to accumulate, you know, twice as many sets, but not so long um, that the rest periods, you know, are, um, you know, 
the sort of like thing that takes up the majority of, you know, the, the training session, uh, you know, relative to a normal training session. Um, so maybe it looks something like, you know, a one ish minute rest period with sets taken to whatever level of failure the person is competent enough to do. And, you know, just choosing from maybe like, you know, one of three exercises that you sort of have like templated out as far as like, okay, these are my go-to options. And maybe like, it just involves changing the order. Uh, maybe it's like, if one thing's taken, you just, you know, you're fine with doing a different order of exercises uh, that still target, you know, the same muscle group and, you know, likely still achieving the same stimulus that way. So just, you know, simply probably not things that, you know, people didn't, you know, already intuitively figure out, but that's kind of where I would go with that middle ground between it's just like you're going through the motions and racing through the workout with very little efficacy per unit rep per unit set all the way to the other end of the spectrum where you're just trying to eke out like everything you can from every rep and every set, regardless of how long, you know, the setup takes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's, that's great. And I think it's important in those instances, not to necessarily be tied to doing the exact same exercise in the exact same way. I do think that there is a little bit of a wiggle room. And of course that depends on how advanced or not your client is, you know, so if they're coming into the gym for the first time, the goal of the session is obviously very different than if you've been training them for five years uh, and where they may have a much better ability to sort of pivot alongside a changing plan. So I do think, of course, there are always contexts in which the application of that could look very different, um, you know, be it shortening rest uh, and picking exercises with with fewer nuances in, in, in the setup, or whether it just be, um, you know, completely uh, changing the exercise because of equipment availability, just anything that can essentially, as you're saying, um, you know, smush more work into, into less time. And I think that, um, you know, like you said in that in that particular example, that might not be the ideal solution or even the 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 remotely close to the best solution, but it's much better to, I think, accumulate the work that you're trying to than to um, you know, essentially miss out on, you know, a lot of a, a potential volume because you're stuck to using an implement or using a specific variation. And I think that's why just the first principles of four stuff is so important because it does give you that ability to pivot when you need to and to not necessarily be tied to any sort of one piece or uh or or one machine uh or even just one kind of implement to to do something you know whether it's d going from a dumbbell thing to a machine thing or a machine thing to a barbell thing there are a lot of different use cases for understanding those first principles um, at the end of the day. So just overall, you know, we covered just kind of in to recap in order, you know, the force properties, you know, point of application, direction, magnitude, and then the sort of equivalence in, you know, uh, resistance training being which tissues we're targeting, how we're doing reps, and then how our, you know, exercise selection is relating to our definition of failure in, in, in different contexts. Is there anything that you want to finish up with just in terms of things that, you know, we maybe didn't touch on uh, broadly that you feel like we're, we're currently missing uh, or, or anything, anything along those lines? Yeah, I think, you know, in practice, uh, as we've discussed before, like when someone is really excited about a new thing or that they're hearing about a concept for the first time or from someone they really trust, like the pendulum can swing really far in a direction. And then sometimes they have to like, uh, you know, swing a little bit back from that to sort of find the sweet spot. And uh, sometimes that's the case uh, here as well in terms of like, um, we want to have options. And I think we want to be able to, um, you know, be sort of variable and be able to, um, you know, be able to navigate like a changing environment where it's like, okay, if I have to switch gyms, if I have to switch the exercise order, if I have to, you know, try to equate the stimulus in any given number of ways, like all is not lost. You know, it's sort of like, you know, when protein timing first became a thing, it was like, well, if I don't have, you know, protein shake right after my workout, you know, then, you know, I'm really not, I'm really missing out, you know, on muscle growth. 
and you know when like um you know if it fits your macros you know really became a thing it was like well it doesn't matter you know really so much what we eat as long as it all kind of adds up you know to, to the same sum total protein carbs and fat at the end of the day you know then it's all good and it's kind of like you know that's an example of pendulum swing where it's like okay too far in rigidity you know is is not where we want to be and on the other end of the the spectrum like too much variability too much uncertainty too much you know of like not having a plan and not having like a consistent structure you know can also be an issue and I think that's much the case here that like in practice, the people that I see make the most progress do have like a fairly rigid structure to the way they do things. And that doesn't mean like that uh, if they have to be flexible, that they don't have the ability to be flexible, you know, much like with the nutrition, it's like, yeah, they probably eat more or less the same thing every day. But if they ran out of, you know, oatmeal and they had to, you know, eat, you know, rice instead or whatever, like it's not the end of the world, but that every day they're not eating at different times. They're not choosing different foods. Like I think in practice, um, you know, having a, a high degree of consistency, regularity um, is a, a really big part of growth. And I was just having this conversation with a client yesterday. Like it's not necessarily like a, in, in absolute where it's like okay if you know we can see in practice that there are plenty of people who don't track their workouts at all just kind of come in look around the gym you know while they're on the you know the bike warming up and say okay what am I going to do today I'm feeling this that or the other thing and with the right genetics under the right circumstances you know that person may grow you know very very well but I do find whether it's taking that person and trying to, you know, solve a problem or whether, you know, it's taking someone from a point where they've kind of just been um, aware of the fact that they want to progress and they're kind of doing what they feel are the right things. It's like, oh, you know, I'm eating enough protein. I'm getting enough sleep. I'm resistance training. Like I train hard, you know, it's like, but I want, you know, I want, you know, to make more progress. The first step is really always just like, creating a plan and starting to, you know, create more of a, of a regular schedule. Um, so I do think in the same respect, like you need to be able to um, adjust on the fly if that's what it calls for. I think there's something to also like um, that the default is consistency and something that you can, you know, track over time, something that like you can set your sights on and move towards so you have a specific goal, you can measure it, and then you can see yourself progressing. Uh, I think in practice, when you lay things out like that, people move, um, you know, much more uh, like proficiently, much more purposefully, um, you know, when they have a, a specific target and they have a, uh, you know, like a regular routine in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's definitely one thing that, um, you know, when we initially start training together however long ago that that was like the biggest difference maker for me it was just being you know just not having an option not to be at the gym at a specific time doing a specific thing for a given amount you know, that was like the biggest difference maker for me and that just has so many sort of second third order effects on the rest of your day where it's almost like everything else needs to be in place for that thing to occur in a standardized fashion so it's like it is it is just training but in a sense, it's also not right. It's like how you how you view your entire day and then as a consequence, how you view your week and then as a consequence, how you view months and and so on and so forth. So that's I think that's a great place to sort of finish off. Um, anyone still listening at this point, all this all this all this uh, time later. Uh, link will be in the description of the uh, podcast, wherever you're listening or if you're watching on YouTube, to join the personal trainer community. We're up to about 60 members and counting every day. So join in on the fun and you'll get live access to the podcast and all sorts of other things that you can check out.